Chapter 2 of A Room with a View. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Room with a View by E. M. Forster. Chapter 2 In Santa Croce with No Baedeker. It was pleasant to wake up in Florence, to open the eyes upon a bright bare room with a floor of red tiles which look clean though they are not, with a painted ceiling whereon pink griffins and blue amorini sport in a forest of yellow violins and bassoons. It was pleasant, too, to fling wide the windows, pinching the fingers in unfamiliar fastenings, to lean out into sunshine with beautiful hills and trees and marble churches opposite, and close below the Arno, gurgling against the embankment of the road. Over the river men were at work with spades and sieves on the sandy foreshore, and on the river was a boat, also diligently employed for some mysterious end. An electric tram came rushing underneath the window. No one was inside it except one tourist, but its platforms were overflowing with Italians, who preferred to stand. Children tried to hang on behind, and the conductor, with no malice, spat in their faces to make them let go. Then soldiers appeared, good-looking undersized men, wearing each a knapsack covered with mangy fur, and a greatcoat which had been cut for some larger soldier. Beside them walked officers, looking foolish and fierce, and before them went little boys, turning somersaults in time with the band. The tram-car became entangled in their ranks, and moved on painfully, like a caterpillar in a swarm of ants. One of the little boys fell down, and some white bullocks came out of an archway. Indeed, if it had not been for the good advice of an old man who was selling buttonhooks, the road might never have got clear. Over such trivialities as these many a valuable hour may slip away, and the traveller who has gone to Italy to study the tactile values of Giotto or the corruption of the papacy may return remembering nothing but the blue sky and the men and women who live under it. So it was as well that Miss Bartlett should tap and come in, and having commented on Lucy's leaving the door unlocked and on her leaning out of the window before she was fully dressed, should urge her to hasten herself or the best of the day would be gone. By the time Lucy was ready her cousin had done her breakfast, and was listening to the clever lady among the crumbs. A conversation then ensued, on not unfamiliar lines. Miss Bartlett was, after all, a wee bit tired, and thought they had better spend the morning settling in, unless Lucy would at all like to go out. Lucy would rather like to go out, as it was her first day in Florence, but of course she could go alone. Miss Bartlett could not allow this. Of course she would accompany Lucy everywhere. Oh, certainly not. Lucy would stop with her cousin. Oh, no, that would never do. Oh, yes. At this point the clever lady broke in. If it is Mrs. Grundy who is troubling you, I do assure you that you can neglect the good person. Being English, Miss Honeychurch will be perfectly safe. Italians understand. A dear friend of mine, Contessa Baroncelli, has two daughters, and when she cannot send a maid to school with them, she lets them go in sailor hats instead. Everyone takes them for English, you see, especially if their hair is strained tightly behind. Miss Bartlett was unconvinced by the safety of Contessa Baroncelli's daughters. She was determined to take Lucy herself, her head not being so very bad. The clever lady then said that she was going to spend a long morning in Santa Croce, and if Lucy would come too, she would be delighted. I will take you by the dear, dirty way back, Miss Honeychurch, and if you bring me luck, we shall have an adventure." Lucy said that this was most kind, and at once opened the Baedeker, to see where Santa Croce was. "'Tut, tut, Miss Lucy. I hope we shall soon emancipate you from Baedeker. He does but touch on the surface of things. As to the true Italy, he does not even dream of it. The true Italy is only to be found by patient observation." This sounded very interesting, and Lucy hurried over her breakfast, and started with her new friend in high spirits. Italy was coming at last. The cockney signora and her works had vanished like a bad dream. Miss Lavish, for that was the clever lady's name, turned to the right along the sunny Lungarno. How delightfully warm! But a wind down the side streets cut like a knife, didn't it? Ponte Allegrazzi, particularly interesting, mentioned by Dante. San Miniato, beautiful as well as interesting, the crucifix that kissed a murderer. Miss Honeychurch would remember the story. The men on the river were fishing. 
untrue, but then so is most information. Then Miss Lavish darted under the archway of the white bullocks, and she stopped, and she cried, A smell! A true Florentine smell! Every city, let me teach you, has its own smell. Is it a very nice smell? said Lucy, who had inherited from her mother a distaste to dirt. One doesn't come to Italy for niceness, was the retort. One comes for life. Buongiorno, buongiorno, bowing right and left. Look at that adorable wine cart. How the driver stares at us, dear simple soul. So Miss Lavish proceeded through the streets of the city of Florence, short, fidgety, and playful as a kitten, though without a kitten's grace. It was a treat for the girl to be with anyone so clever and so cheerful, and a blue military cloak, such as an Italian officer wears, only increased the sense of festivity. Buongiorno. Take the word of an old woman, Miss Lucy. You will never repent of a little civility to your inferiors. That is the true democracy, though I am a real radical as well. There, now you're shocked. Indeed I'm not, exclaimed Lucy. We are radicals too, out and out. My father always voted for Mr. Gladstone until he was so dreadful about Ireland. I see, I see. And now you have gone over to the enemy. Oh, please. If my father was alive, I am sure he would vote radical again, now that Ireland is all right. And as it is, the glass over our front door was broken last election, and Freddy is sure it was the Tories. But Mother says nonsense, a tramp. Shameful. A manufacturing district, I suppose? No, in the Surrey Hills, about five miles from Dorking, looking over the Weld. Miss Lavish seemed interested, and slackened her trot. What a delightful part! I know it so well. It is full of the very nicest people. Do you know Sir Harry Otway? A radical, if ever there was. Very well, indeed. And old Mrs. Butterworth, the philanthropist? Why, she rents a field of us! How funny! Miss Lavish looked at the narrow ribbon of sky, and murmured, "'Oh, you have property in Surrey?' "'Hardly any,' said Lucy, fearful of being thought a snob. "'Only thirty acres, just the garden, all downhill, and some fields.' Miss Lavish was not disgusted, and said it was just the size of her aunt's Suffolk estate. Italy receded. They tried to remember the last name of Lady Louisa Someone, who had taken a house near Summer Street the other year, but she had not liked it, which was odd of her. And just as Miss Lavish had got the name, she broke off and exclaimed, "'Bless us! Bless us and save us! We've lost the way!' Certainly they had seemed a long time in reaching Santa Croce, the tower of which had been plainly visible from the landing window. But Miss Lavish had said so much about knowing her Florence by heart that Lucy had followed her with no misgivings. Lost, lost. My dear Lucy, during our political diatribes we have taken a wrong turning. How those horrid conservatives would jeer at us. What are we to do? Two lone females in an unknown town? Now this is what I call an adventure. Lucy, who wanted to see Santa Croce, suggested, as a possible solution, that they should ask the way there. Oh, but that is the word of a craven. And no, you are not, not, not to look at your Baedeker. Give it to me. I shan't let you carry it. We will simply drift. Accordingly they drifted through a series of those grey-brown streets, neither commodious nor picturesque, in which the eastern quarter of the city abounds. Lucy soon lost interest in the discontent of Lady Louisa, and became discontented herself. For one ravishing moment Italy appeared. She stood in the square of the Annunziata, and saw in the living terracotta those divine babies whom no cheap reproduction can ever stale. There they stood, with their shining limbs bursting from the garments of charity, and their strong white arms extended against circlets of heaven. Lucy thought she had never seen anything more beautiful. But Miss Lavish, with a shriek of dismay, dragged her forward, declaring that they were out of their path now by at least a mile. The hour was approaching at which the continental breakfast begins, or rather ceases to tell, and the ladies bought some hot chestnut paste out of a little shop, because it looked so typical. It tasted partly of the paper in which it was wrapped, partly of hair oil, partly of the great unknown. But it gave them strength to drift into another piazza, large and dusty 
on the farther side of which rose a black and white façade of surpassing ugliness. Miss Lavish spoke to it dramatically. It was Santa Croce. The adventure was over. Stop a minute. Let those two people go on, or I shall have to speak to them. I do detest conventional intercourse. Nasty. They are going into the church, too. Oh, the British are abroad. We sat opposite to them at dinner last night. They have given us their rooms. They were so very kind. Look at their figures, laughed Miss Lavish. They walk through my Italy like a pair of cows. It's very naughty of me, but I would like to set an examination paper at Dover and turn back every tourist who couldn't pass it. What would you ask us? Miss Lavish laid her hand pleasantly on Lucy's arm, as if to suggest that she, at all events, would get full marks. In this exalted mood they reached the steps of the great church, and were about to enter it, when Miss Lavish stopped, squeaked, flung up her arms, and cried, "'There goes my local colour-box. I must have a word with him.' And in a moment she was away over the piazza, her military cloak flapping in the wind, nor did she slacken speed till she caught up an old man with white whiskers and nipped him playfully upon the arm. Lucy waited for nearly ten minutes. Then she began to get tired. The beggars worried her, the dust blew in her eyes, and she remembered that a young girl ought not to loiter in public places. She descended slowly into the piazza with the intention of rejoining Miss Lavish, who was really almost too original. But at that moment Miss Lavish and her local colour-box moved also, and disappeared down a side street, both gesticulating largely. Tears of indignation came to Lucy's eyes, partly because Miss Lavish had jilted her, partly because she had taken her Baedeker. How could she find her way home? How could she find her way about in Santa Croce? Her first morning was ruined and she might never be in Florence again. A few minutes ago she had been all high spirits, talking as a woman of culture, and half persuading herself that she was full of originality. Now she entered the church depressed and humiliated, not even able to remember whether it was built by the Franciscans or the Dominicans. Of course it must be a wonderful building, but how like a barn, and how very cold. Of course it contained frescoes by Giotto, in the presence of whose tactile values she was capable of feeling what was proper. But who was to tell her which they were? She walked about disdainfully, unwilling to be enthusiastic over monuments of uncertain authorship or date. There was no one even to tell her which, of all the sepulchral slabs that paved the nave and transepts, was the one that was really beautiful, the one that had been most praised by Mr. Ruskin. Then the pernicious charm of Italy worked on her, and, instead of acquiring information, she began to be happy. She puzzled out the Italian notices, the notices that forbade people to introduce dogs into the church, the notice that prayed people, in the interest of health and out of respect to the sacred edifice in which they found themselves, not to spit. She watched the tourists. Their noses were as red as their Baedekers, so cold was Santa Croce. She beheld the horrible fate that overtook three papists, two he-babies and a she-baby, who began their career by sousing each other with the holy water, and then proceeded to the Machiavelli memorial, dripping but hallowed. Advancing towards it very slowly and from immense distances, they touched the stone with their fingers, with their handkerchiefs, with their heads, and then retreated. What could this mean? They did it again and again. Then Lucy realized that they had mistaken Machiavelli for some saint, hoping to acquire virtue. Punishment followed quickly. The smallest he-baby stumbled over one of the sepulchral slabs so much admired by Mr. Ruskin and entangled his feet in the features of a recumbent bishop. Protestant as she was, Lucy darted forward. She was too late. He fell heavily upon the prelate's upturned toes. "'Hateful bishop!' exclaimed the voice of old Mr. Emerson, who had darted forward also. "'Hard in life, hard in death. Go out into the sunshine, little boy, and kiss your hand to the sun, for that is where you ought to be. Intolerable bishop!' The child screamed frantically at these words, and at these dreadful people who picked him up, dusted him, rubbed his bruises, and told him not to be superstitious. "'Look at him,' said Mr. Emerson to Lucy. "'Here's a mess, a baby hurt, cold and frightened. But what else can you expect from a church?' The child's legs had become as melting wax. 
Each time that old Mr. Emerson and Lucy set it erect it collapsed with a roar. Fortunately an Italian lady, who ought to have been saying her prayers, came to the rescue. By some mysterious virtue, which mothers alone possess, she stiffened the little boy's backbone and imparted strength to his knees. He stood. Still gibbering with agitation, he walked away. "'You are a clever woman,' said Mr. Emerson. "'You have done more than all the relics in the world. I am not of your creed, but I do believe in those who make their fellow creatures happy. There is no scheme of the universe—' He paused for a phrase. "'Niente,' said the Italian lady, and returned to her prayers. "'I'm not sure she understands English,' suggested Lucy. In her chastened mood she no longer despised the Emersons. She was determined to be gracious to them, beautiful rather than delicate, and if possible, to erase Miss Bartlett's civility by some gracious reference to the pleasant rooms. "'That woman understands everything,' was Mr. Emerson's reply. "'But what are you doing here? Are you doing the church? Are you through with the church?' "'No,' cried Lucy, remembering her grievance. I came here with Miss Lavish, who was to explain everything, and just by the door—it is too bad—she simply ran away, and after waiting quite a time I had to come in by myself." "'Why shouldn't you?' said Mr. Emerson. "'Yes, why shouldn't you come by yourself?' said the son, addressing the young lady for the first time. "'But Miss Lavish has even taken away Baedeker.' "'Baedeker?' said Mr. Emerson. "'I'm glad it's that you minded. It's worth minding the loss of a Baedeker. That's worth minding." Lucy was puzzled. She was again conscious of some new idea, and was not sure whither it would lead her. "'If you've no Baedeker,' said the son, "'you'd better join us.' Was this where the idea would lead? She took refuge in her dignity. "'Thank you very much, but I could not think of that. I hope you do not suppose that I came to join on to you. I really came to help with the child and to thank you for so kindly giving us your rooms last night. I hope that you have not been put to any great inconvenience." "'My dear,' said the old man gently, "'I think you are repeating what you have heard older people say. You are pretending to be touchy, but you are not really. Stop being so tiresome, and tell me instead what part of the church you want to see. To take you to it will be a real pleasure. Now this was abominably impertinent, and she ought to have been furious. But it is sometimes as difficult to lose one's temper as it is difficult at other times to keep it. Lucy could not get cross. Mr. Emerson was an old man, and surely a girl might humour him. On the other hand, his son was a young man, and she felt that a girl ought to be offended with him, or at all events be offended before him. It was at him that she gazed before replying, "'I am not touchy, I hope. It is the Jottos that I want to see, if you will kindly tell me which they are." The son nodded. With a look of sombre satisfaction he led the way to the Peruzzi chapel. There was a hint of the teacher about him. She felt like a child in school who had answered a question rightly. The chapel was already filled with an earnest congregation, and out of them rose the voice of a lecturer, directing them how to worship Giotto, not by tactful valuations, but by the standards of the spirit. Remember, he was saying, the facts about this church of Santa Croce, how it was built by faith in the full fervor of medievalism, before any taint of the Renaissance had appeared. Observe how Giotto in these frescoes, now, unhappily, ruined by restoration, is untroubled by the snares of anatomy and perspective. Could anything be more majestic, more pathetic? beautiful, true. How little, we feel, avails knowledge and technical cleverness against a man who truly feels." No! exclaimed Mr. Emerson, in much too loud a voice for church. Remember nothing of the sort. Built by faith, indeed. That simply means the workmen weren't paid properly. And as for the frescoes, I see no truth in them. Look at that fat man in blue. He must weigh as much as I do, and he is shooting into the sky like an air balloon." He was referring to the fresco of the Ascension of St. John. Inside, the lecturer's voice faltered, as well it might. The audience shifted uneasily, and so did Lucy. She was sure that she ought not to be with these men, but they had cast a spell over her. 
They were so serious and so strange that she could not remember how to behave. Now, did this happen or didn't it? Yes or no? George replied, It happened like this, if it happened at all. I would rather go up to heaven by myself than be pushed by cherubs, and if I got there, I should like my friends to lean out of it, just as they do here. You will never go up, said his father. You and I, dear boy, will lie at peace in the earth that bore us, and our names will disappear as surely as our work survives. Some of the people can only see the empty grave, not the saint, whoever he is, going up. It did happen like that, if it happened at all. Pardon me, said a frigid voice. The chapel is somewhat small for two parties. We will incommode you no longer. The lecturer was a clergyman, and his audience must be also his flock, for they held prayer books as well as guide books in their hands. They filed out of the chapel in silence. Amongst them were the two little old ladies of the pension Bertolini, Miss Teresa and Miss Catherine Allen. Stop! cried Mr. Emerson. There's plenty of room for us all. Stop! The procession disappeared without a word. Soon the lecturer could be heard in the next chapel, describing the life of St. Francis. George, I do believe that clergyman is the Brixton curate. George went into the next chapel and returned, saying, Perhaps he is. I don't remember. Then I had better speak to him and remind him who I am. It's that Mr. Eager. Why did he go? Did we talk too loud? How vexatious. I shall go and say we are sorry. Hadn't I better? Then perhaps he will come back. He will not come back, said George. But Mr. Emerson, contrite and unhappy, hurried away to apologize to the Reverend Cuthbert Eager. Lucy, apparently absorbed in a lunette, could hear the lecture again interrupted, the anxious, aggressive voice of the old man, the curt, injured replies of his opponent. The son, who took every little contretemps as if it were a tragedy, was listening also. My father has that effect on nearly everyone, he informed her. He will try to be kind. I hope we all try, said she smiling nervously. Because we think it improves our characters, but he is kind to people because he loves them, and they find him out and are offended or frightened. How silly of them, said Lucy, though in her heart she sympathized. I think that a kind action done tactfully— Tact? He threw up his head in disdain. Apparently she had given the wrong answer. She watched the singular creature pace up and down the chapel. For a young man his face was rugged and— until the shadows fell upon it, hard. In shadowed it sprang into tenderness. She saw him once again at Rome, on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, carrying a burden of acorns. Healthy and muscular, he yet gave her the feeling of grayness, of tragedy, that might only find solution in the night. The feeling soon passed. It was unlike her to have entertained anything so subtle. Born of silence and of unknown emotion, it passed when Mr. Emerson returned, and she could re-enter the world of rapid talk, which was alone familiar to her. "'Were you snubbed?' asked his son tranquilly. "'But we've spoiled the pleasure of I don't know how many people. They won't come back.' "'Full of innate sympathy. Quickness to perceive good in others. Vision of the brotherhood of man.' Scraps of the lecture on St. Francis came floating round the partition wall. Don't let us spoil yours. He continued to Lucy. Have you looked at those saints? Yes, said Lucy. They are lovely. Do you know which is the tombstone that is praised in Ruskin? He did not know, and suggested that they should try to guess it. George, rather to her relief, refused to move, and she and the old man wandered not unpleasantly about Santa Croce, which, though it is like a barn, has harvested many beautiful things inside its walls. There were also beggars to avoid, and guides to dodge round the pillars, and an old lady with her dog, and here and there a priest modestly edging to his mass through the groups of tourists. But Mr. Emerson was only half interested. He watched the lecturer, whose success he believed he had impaired, and then he anxiously watched his son. "'Why will he look at that fresco?' he said uneasily. "'I saw nothing in it.' "'I like Giotto,' she replied. It is so wonderful what they say about his tactile values, though I like things like the Della Robbia babies better. So you ought. A baby is worth a dozen saints, and my baby's worth the whole of paradise, and as far as I can see he lives in hell. 
Lucy again felt that this did not do. In hell, he repeated. He's unhappy. Oh, dear, said Lucy. How can he be unhappy when he is strong and alive? What more is one to give him? And think how he has been brought up, free from all the superstition and ignorance that lead men to hate one another in the name of God? With such an education as that, I thought he was bound to grow up happy. She was no theologian, but she felt that here was a very foolish old man, as well as a very irreligious one. She also felt that her mother might not like her talking to that kind of person, and that Charlotte would object most strongly. What are we to do with him? he asked. He comes out for his holiday to Italy and behaves like that, like the little child who ought to have been playing and who hurt himself upon the tombstone. Eh? What did you say? Lucy had made no suggestion. Suddenly he said, Now don't be stupid over this. I don't require you to fall in love with my boy, but I do think you might try and understand him. You are nearer his age, and if you let yourself go, I am sure you are sensible. You might help me. He has known so few women, and you have the time. You stop here several weeks, I suppose. But let yourself go. You are inclined to get muddled, if I may judge from last night. Let yourself go. Pull out from the depths those thoughts that you do not understand, and spread them out in the sunlight, and know the meaning of them. By understanding George, you may learn to understand yourself. It will be good for both of you. To this extraordinary speech Lucy found no answer. I only know what it is that's wrong with him, not why it is. And what is it? asked Lucy fearfully, expecting some harrowing tale. The old trouble. Things won't fit. What things? The things of the universe. It is quite true. They don't. Oh, Mr. Emerson, whatever do you mean? In his ordinary voice, so that she scarcely realized he was quoting poetry, he said, From far, from eve and morning, and yon twelve-winded sky, the stuff of life to knit me blew hither. Here am I. George and I both know this, but why does it distress him? We know that we come from the winds, and that we shall return to them that all life is perhaps a knot a tangle a blemish in the eternal smoothness but why should this make us unhappy let us rather love one another and work and rejoice i don't believe in this world sorrow miss honeychurch assented then make my boy think like us make him realize that by the side of the everlasting why there is a yes a transitory yes if you like but a yes. Suddenly she laughed. Surely one ought to laugh. A young man melancholy because the universe wouldn't fit, because life was a tangle or a wind or a yes or something. I'm very sorry, she cried. You'll think me unfeeling, but... but... Then she became matronly. Oh, but your son wants employment. Has he no particular hobby? Why, I myself have worries, but I can generally forget them at the piano. And collecting stamps did no end of good for my brother. Perhaps Italy bores him. You ought to try the Alps or the lakes. The old man's face saddened, and he touched her gently with his hand. This did not alarm her. She thought that her advice had impressed him and that he was thanking her for it. Indeed, he no longer alarmed her at all. She regarded him as a kind thing, but quite silly. Her feelings were as inflated spiritually as they had been an hour ago aesthetically, before she lost Baedeker. The dear George, now striding towards them over the tombstones, seemed both pitiable and absurd. He approached, his face in the shadow. He said, "'Miss Bartlett?' "'Oh, good gracious me!' said Lucy, suddenly collapsing and again seeing the whole of life in a new perspective. "'Where? Where?' "'In the nave.' "'I see. Those gossiping little Miss Allens must have—' She checked herself. "'Poor girl!' exploded Mr. Emerson. Poor girl. She could not let this pass, for it was just what she was feeling herself. Poor girl. I fail to understand the point of that remark. I think myself a very fortunate girl, I assure you. I'm thoroughly happy and having a splendid time. Pray don't waste time mourning over me. There's enough sorrow in the world, isn't there, without trying to invent it. Good-bye. Thank you both so much for all your kindness. 
Ah, yes, there does come my cousin. A delightful morning. Santa Croce is a wonderful church. She joined her cousin. End of chapter 2